All right, so let's turn in our Bibles to X, sorry, Genesis 2. We're going to start with the J creation story, which is the second that you can find in the Genesis creation stories. Genesis 2, um, 4 through 24. Genesis 2, 4 through 24. Let's see what's going on here. Take this apart just a little bit. Uh, who would like to read, um, say, the first four verses? I can. Why don't we just go around and read okay. this way? Let's this start way. with you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> just take about three or four verses and. Sure. This is the uh, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not set rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living, living being. Keep going. All right. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to, this, to sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The first river is the Pishon. It flows around the country of Havilah. Pure gold is found there, and also rare perfume and precious stones. The second river is Gihon. Mm -hmm. It flows around the country of Havilah. The third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He told them, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Right. <clears throat> uh, then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So our so out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to the animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and, then, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up uh, its place with flesh. Good. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Wonderful. All right, so we have a number of cast, a cast of characters here. Um, we have God, and, and there's a garden, and there are all the eventually animals, and there's a man and a, a, a tree. And it, but what does it say about God in relationship to, to all that he has? in this story and the scene so far. Um, again, I'm, I'm really kind of harping on this idea of relationship. Um, God in relation. Well, first of all, um, he has a relationship with creation in the sense that he created it, right? So he's creator. It does say that even in this, um, in this first, most probably first written account of creation. 
what, what else? What, uh, what are the other relationships that God has? First of all, um, he is independent of the world still, right? To be a creator, he is independent. But, but he's not just transcendent. He seems to also be in creation as well, right? Are you familiar with deism? Have you ever heard of that term deism? We know what that is. This is not a deistic creator, is it? Um, this is a creator who's very much involved in the ongoing processes of creation. So um, there's this relationship here. And you know, just, just, just a flag for people. Um, sometimes, every now and then, I get a whiff of deism in our congregations. I don't know why or how. Someone who thinks that God is just a way off somewhere else doing his thing and here we are trying to muddle along with what God has given us, and there's no real continuing interaction between the two, between creator and creation. It's really not the picture we're getting here, is it? And if this again is a myth, uh, it has explanatory force for who we are now and our relationship to God now. Um, so, just to prick your ears up to see if, you know, do we really think that God is continuing on in, in the work in the world? Um, we pray it sometimes. Do we believe it? And then even to make it more personal, is that God somehow interacting with me? So, um, we also know what, 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 well, I'll just kind of go through these things that I've noted and, and add to them if you can. But in God's relationship to Adam, um, and I'm not sure if it's Eve at this point or not, I didn't remember, but he, he does command, does he not? He says, you know, you can go roam around, you can eat of everything, enjoy yourself. One thing you can't do. He's eaten that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Command, yes. Um, so, to me, this begins um, a relationship that one part of it, anyways, is command, obey. Gosh, and I don't like to hear that very much, but <laughs> there it is. You know, uh, I had a theology professor in seminary low these many years ago who, who really thought that that was the basic bedrock relationship that we have to God, is this. Something to think about. Maybe we can talk about this in relation to some of the other things that I think can, can be found in here. But um, not only does he have the sense of command, obey, but there's also the fact that God is caring and concerned. Um, so we say that, I guess, because he notices that Adam doesn't have a helpmate, um, that he's probably getting lonely. and. Uh, he, he could use some companionship. So God cares and is concerned. Um, it's not good for you to be alone. What is this? Does this sound like the God we know so far or not? Is this different? <coughs> is this Jesus? Mm -hmm. The command obey part. Hmm? Yeah. Not, yeah, I think he would have given up on us a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're never gonna get this. I think it's, but I mean, it's definitely I see more relationship because he walked in, walked in the garden with us. That's right. The whole thing about relationship again. Well, even the way that he describes forming man, like you know. The other things almost seemed a little bit passive in a way, like, you know, if there was water right. and it would raise through the earth and right. no trees planted. But then with the man, he took the dust, he, he breathed in, 
into his nostrils the breath of life. Like it seems so much yeah. more yeah. personal yeah. than the rest. Yeah. Or just intimate. Different. Yeah. yeah. Very much. So man is singled out in a way that is that the other creation is not and, and has things to do, a purpose. Anything else about this God that we get so far in the story? We're going to turn and look at uh, man in relationship now. Adam means man. <clears throat> Um, certainly he's in relationship to the woman, Adam's own rib. Uh, Adam is first, but to say that Eve is subordinate, I'm getting this from one of the books. They say that to say that Eve is subordinate to Adam is too strong. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and, be, and they become one flesh. Again, who was it? Nikki, you talked about unity a lot. And I think that was mine. I was going to say, I think that might be That was you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it would be. <laughs> okay, that was yours. Unity. <coughs> that sense of... It's not subordinate in any way. It's, it's, it's working together. It's being together. It is union, uh, united. And... They are nude together, nude together, and do not know it. Um, I think you covered that somewhat, but uh, again, this may symbolize an initial sense of innocence or lack of awareness. Um, I think one of the books makes the point that they're sort of like no different than the other animals of creation in, in a way. Uh, they, they don't have that self-awareness. Um, so, again, if you're talking about man and relationship, um, you also have the sense of command obey. Let's just put <laughs> obey God's commands. And of course, this obedience becomes stronger the farther you go on in, into the into into um, uh, uh, Genesis and also Exodus. Of course, it th reaches the high point, uh, literally and figuratively, on Sinai with the giving of the law, uh, which is a, a structured way of being obedient, being in relationship, being righteous. We'll talk more about that. Um, another thing that I think most of us talked about in our papers was the fact that uh, God, or excuse me, Adam is free uh, to be in these relationships, to be doing what he wants to do uh, in relationship to. Eve and the rest of creation, but again, with this command of a relationship, there's there's limits. So it's freedom within um, some kind of bounds. And that we'll see over and over again throughout the, um, the Old Testament, and that is of God helping to demarcate the, bio, the boundaries of, of what's acceptable, what is not. Um, and again, we'll continue to see Israel or individuals overstep those boundaries. So let's continue on. Um, Lisa, you want to read um, the first <coughs> th three verses of chapter three? three. Sure. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? From any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God 
did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You want to finish off through seven? Sure. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight for, to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loin coverings. <coughs> All right, so into this Edenic situation enters the snake. And it gets the couple to question God's prohibition and perhaps the consequences of, of their actions. Um, one of our writers asks us to compare this with the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, and he writes, when in Kidu, the companion of Gilgamesh, is first introduced, he roams with the wild beasts until he is tamed by a harlot. When he returns to the beasts, they run off, and he cannot keep up with them as before. The harlot tells him, you have become profound in, Kindu, in, in Kidu. You have become like a god. And the author uh, has in parentheses, or at least, or maybe that's me, um, at least, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it was a long time ago that I read that. Um, he's, he's becoming at least like a human being as we would know him, right? Uh, so uh, again, there's, there's that sort of anthropological approach that we can take to this, which is somewhat interesting. Um, I think there is merit in talking about it because it does have kind of some kind of explanatory force. It does resonate with us a little bit. Um, it's not necessarily uh, biblical or anything like that, but um, now that they've eaten of the fruit of the forbidden tree, they have self-consciousness and they must confront death. It also gains a richness of life that the animals do not have. Um, Somehow he's able to take more control of his destiny and a bit of a break from dependence on God. Um, maybe take God's control a little bit. So, seeing the scene as it is in this first creation story, what... What, what, what is sin? And why is there sin? And what are the consequences of sin? What do you say? What have you learned about sin so far? From this story. So far, these verses. Not, not obeying God. Simply that. <laughs> not obeying God. It's... <laughs> trying to think of a profound way to say it. No, no, no. It's, it's obedience? Yeah. It's obedience, right. Um, this, uh, and because of that, I would say, if there's this command-obey relationship, and they have disobeyed, then that is indeed going to break, in some way, the relationship. Yes? I mean that follows logically, so it's a it's a break of relationship, a breach of relationship. What else? What else have we learned in this story about sin? <clears throat> Anything? Well, soon I think we'll we'll be able to get some ideas about what righteousness is, what a right relationship is. Those words haven't really been used, I don't think, yet. But um, let's look at some of the cons... Did, was someone going to say something? Yeah, I'm also, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, too, if you can say, um, is sin... Is sin is sin 
and be more reliant reliant on something outside instead of God like mm -hmm. you know so yeah the serpent challenged Eve mm -hmm. and the way I picture it is you know God's been walking through the garden with them you I, I would think that Eve would say hey God check out the serpent he's saying that you know it's okay to eat from that did I misunderstand something like mm -hmm. so I think it's it's also sin is taking Taking, taking things from the outside that interfere with that relationship with God. Yeah. Um, I think I get what you mean. It's like, um, is it, is it, it's, it's not relying on God, is it? Right. Not believing God. Not believing God. Um, <coughs> not relying on God. I'm going to put both of those things on. I've, I've never not relied on God before. Hmm. <laughs> not believing. So really the uh, serpent is sort of challenging what God said. Oh, you're not going to. Right, come on. Let's, let's uh, call his bluff. Of course, there are consequences to this sin, um, and we talked about that. You talked about it very well in your papers. Um, women have greater pain in childbirth. Oh, actually, we haven't gotten there yet. Let's look at that. Let's look at uh, three, chapter three, verses eight through twenty-four, and just kind of go around and read three or four verses, and we'll just keep reading eight through twenty-four. That evening they heard the Lord God walking in the garden, and they hid from him among the trees. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. Did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? Yeah. Is that 12? Different translation. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hard to find it. The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to, to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> In pain, well, let's see. Yeah, you were mid. You're in the first. middle of it. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the, all, you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. <clears throat> then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us. Us? Yep. <laughs> that is us. Yep. Made me curious. Knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and the sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. I guess it was that cherubim. <laughs> <laughs> that was the us. Yeah. Sidekick. God's sidekick. <laughs> 
All right, thank you for reading that. So consequences here. Um, certainly there's greater pain in childbirth. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Yeah. Leslie, were you getting to that in your paper? <laughs> Just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I touched it. Uh huh. <laughs> the ground. I went there. <laughs> you went there, yeah. The ground is cursed, it's hard labor, and they are ultimately tossed out of the garden. The loss of God, the blessing of God's presence. Interesting. Sent out to cultivate. Hmm. Somehow, mortal life and death have come into creation. And all of this has, we were talking about purposes in our paper quite a bit, um, undermines the purposes of man. I think one of the authors quoted something to this effect that, uh, you know, one of the purposes according to the story was to be fruitful and multiply, but then it's painful and, and hard to bear children. Um, to subdue the earth, but now it becomes uh, hard and arduous and painful. And dominion over the creatures is replaced by conflict. And what does verse 15 say? Verse 15. Now we'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay. So it's, in a sense, the, the snake, but maybe as a representative of, of other creatures. So, um, the consequences of sin are certainly pain and death, uh, difficulty, confusion, a rupture in the relationship with creation and God and um, one another, I don't know, maybe. Yes? Something to think about. Uh, well, I think so, because I, I, I just think it's really funny, because as soon as you know, sin enters the world, right away we're blaming somebody else for our actions. Excellent point. <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> then, so, so not only yeah. is our relationship with God broken, but our relationship with each other that's, is that's immediately right. affected. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Wow, what a bummer. <laughs> All this happened because of one apple. What a drag, huh? <laughs> um, other consequences that you want to mention? I'm getting a fairly robust picture of what sin is and what the consequences are. I think we'll be able to add to it, but I want to just stop for a moment or give us a little sidebar, perhaps, and think a little bit in Christian terms, the history of Christianity about the image of God and original sin. Actually, I'm going to hold that off, um, but we're going to get back to that. Uh, does anyone need a break at all? Are we good? We're going to keep going for a while? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's then look at um, the, f the first in terms of Genesis, the passage, that first creation story, and see if we can uh, fill out more of this picture of what sin is and and its consequences and, and, and God in relationship and us in relationship. So, let's see. Uh, Lisa, could you read Genesis 1, 1 through 5? Sure. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Okay. So, just looking at the first two verses, we get a sense of God and what God is up to and how God is doing this. It's very ordered, isn't it? 
Um, and even the, the form of the verses, this pattern that the uh, um, P writer is going to use, the priestly writer is going to use, is, is very formulaic and very structured and very ordered. Um, so Rutledge suggests that uh, this account was probably done while either while in Babylonian captivity or after the Babylonian captivity um, when God is recreating and reordering Israel after the kind of chaos of, of captivity. And though it, it, it calls the Babylonian myths, creation myths to mind, even perhaps uses them as a jumping off point, it was created to be distinctly different Right? in contradistinction from the Babylonian myths. Um, one of the authors writes, I think it was Rutledge, the imagery is removed from its original pagan setting and given new meaning and significance. Rather than depicting rival gods fighting for power, right? the Old Testament emphasizes that there's only one God who is the Lord of heaven and earth. And when the chaos comp, the idea of chaos, uh, appears in this context, it's concerned primar primarily not with God's initial victory in a cosmic pre-creation battle, but with God's ongoing power over creation and his ongoing presence in the world, ordering, ordering, ordering. So just quickly, um, a couple of things that our authors point out. Um, you may find this, you may have people ask questions about this, the difference between the, in the beginning God created and in the beginning when God was creating. There's a, hear the difference? And apparently all it is is a matter of how the Hebrew, the, the words in Hebrew are pointed. And we don't really know how it was. It could have been either. Um, it could be in the beginning God created or in the beginning when God created. If it's a temporal clause, the second, when God created, it becomes similar to the Enimu Elish, as Collins was pointing out. Um, the deep Tehom is a cognate of Tiamat. When God's spirit hovers over the face of the deep, the deep Tehom is a cognate of Tiamat. But Rutledge would think that, again, it's in, to separate it from the Babylonian myth. If temporal, then um, certainly if, if it was temporal, then there's more of wiggle room to say that it wasn't um, ex nihilo that uh, there was a formless void and the wind swept over um, the face of the deep and God continues to create order but what about what was this watery chaos thing was that there before did God create it did God create it earlier did some other God create it or did God just happen upon this eternal thing um, again, Rutledge would, would say that the point of this really is God's creation ordering or creating order out of the chaos. Whether the chaos was there, God created, whatever. What we're really interested in is the fact that creation is this ordering of chaos and that if you think about God continuing to be with God's people and God imminent in the world and with people's own lives, right, then God continues to order and make order out of chaos. Um, one of the authors says, chaos is the opposite of creation rather than unbeing. I mean, there's we look at it being as being and, and not not being or nothing. But he wants to say that 
the cre creation author, this first account in Genesis 1, chaos is the opposite of creation. Right? So chaos is the opposite of this orderly uh, manifestation or making that God is, is doing. Sin and the rejection of God's purposes for the world can open the way for the world to revert to chaos once again. So, sin, disobedience, breaking a relationship, not relying on God, not believing in what God says, can have the result or the consequence of uh, bringing chaos, more chaos, back into the world. And probably that, we can see that in the first, if we look at the Genesis 2 and following account, right? So there's this notion of, of, of chaos. Um, Rutledge says, chaos still, can, uh, still exists and God holds it back. And it may be allowed to return as a result of human sin. So it's a very interesting image of God holding back the chaos, kind of battling back the chaos, like this light uh, battling back the darkness, you know. Um, but with enough messing around by us, this, this chaos can still come through. Um, and the flood is a way of, of, of showing that mythically, the story of the flood. One of the authors says, chaos and disorder still threaten to disrupt God's purposes, monsters in the form of nations, or idolatry or unbelief still threaten the life and faith of God's people. But Isaiah and other of the um, prophets dealing with the Babylonian captivity see the Babylonian captivity in these terms and they also recast it in sort of a cosmic end of time battle between chaos and order as well. So it is a, a truly kind of an eternal st struggle. We don't want to say that, that it's dualistic, you know, chaos versus God, but um, that chaos is always kind of there ready to, to jump out. And uh, with enough sin on our part, then that chaos can disrupt. And yet God is always, as we know, able to make the most of it, redeem. What did he do with Adam and Eve? Helped them sow some fig leaves <laughs> together, right? Um, piece things together. Uh, it wasn't completely the, the terrible consequences that at first thought God sort of reneged and um, things continued on, not quite as good as they could have been, but, but continued on. Um, God, who created the world out of chaos, has the power to deliver Israel and us from the chaos of exile and sin. So, um, interestingly, our book goes on to say that uh, the Exodus was a both cr creative and redeeming event in the sense that it created God's people and it redeemed them from slavery in Israel. And the deliverance from, from Babylon was a creative act as well, recreating uh, and renewing Israel as they hadn't been before and breaking, bringing them out of um, redeeming them out of, from another country so how are we doing on time here all right um, good for a few more minutes or shall we take a break Keep going, keep rolling along. Okay, we're still looking at this.
second chronologically passage of creation. And um, I think we can add to this list of consequences of sin, not only does um, it kind of destroy the purposes for which we're created sin, but it, uh, ha it brings in an element of chaos into the world. Okay? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna make a sign. No chaos, so mm -hmm. I put it on the desk. <laughs> just, just let's stop for a moment and, and, and think about this. Um, this is what we have so far. What is sin, disobedience, break of relationship, uh, not relying on God, not believing in what God says? It subverts the purposes for which God created us, and it injects an element of chaos back into the world. How are we doing on our understanding of sin? <coughs> is that about right? <coughs> I was fascinated by the whole idea of um, kind of the relationship between sin and chaos. I, I really hadn't thought about that that much, but if God is the God of order and ordering, and I, we think he's ordering our lives and our church and our world, um, then with sin, with breaking of relationship with ourselves or others or God, then and this chaos can sort of break out again into the world of God sort of holding it back, if you will. Not that God will not deal with it, but um, I think of, I think my wife's a music teacher, right? And she, she loves teaching music. She loves teaching little kids music because they'll, they're up for anything. You know, second graders, you can do anything with them, play games and sing and do them at the same time, and they're just happy as clams. They'll follow their, their <laughs> obedient, if you will. High school choir is another animal altogether, right? And there's so much drama there, so much chaos injected <laughs> into that system that it makes it very difficult for my wife, and it's not her favorite thing to do. Um, but she has to do it anyway. So that's sort of a practical application I see of, uh, of this. Um, I don't know. You know, and I see people whose lives are broken because of addiction of one kind or another. And there is an element of chaos there, isn't there? Um, their lives are disordered. And we, I often try to help people who are in tough situations, um, you know, they come to me asking for um, a hotel room for a night or something like that. And I will ask them what's going on, you know, what, why, how have you gotten to this point in your life and, and what's the cause of this? And it's often the case that they their relationships are all, are all broken, they're in disarray, they burn their bridges, um, their lives are so chaotic that they can't make things string together. And uh, it's very sad, it's just very, very sad. I, I see chaos in their life. I'm getting a visual, yeah. um, <laughs> like putting it forward yeah. to Jesus being the shepherd, yeah. and we are all these sheep that are just yes. like, we know where we're supposed to go, and we just can't. And someone's always needing to be hooked back in. Yes, and even beautiful. when you're good, you're not. And I guess that's the chaos that's that beautiful. again. Yeah, I love that. It's the little kid dog. thing, but <laughs> <laughs> or cats or sheep. I mean, or... There's a good reason there's dogs. <laughs> but, it, but I think too that you know, like he's saying, well, we know what we we know what we're supposed to do, and I think that that the breaking the relationship with God. 
broke our hearing him clearly. Right. And so therefore, yep, yep, yep. You know, sometimes we go, well, is this what God wants me to do? Or is this just something my brain's making up? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's a consequence of the fall. That's, that's not being in that intimate connection with, with God so that we can hear clearly what, what God is saying. Yeah, you're right. What else? Well, so in terms of this story, this Genesis 1 story, looking at, at man, and is it okay if I just say man? Yes. You know what I mean, man and woman? Yes. Or you can just say woman. <laughs> you can do that too? <laughs> good. That's a good point, Dale. Woman is created in the image of God. So there's this whole idea of, of being the image of God, and we talked a little bit earlier about how Adam, God, or Adam is special, uh, and, and, and this is spelled out, I think, more in the, in the sense of this image of God. Um, some of the things I called about image, images and the image of God from our books said that Images in the ancient Near East were important for worship as they made the presence of God manifest to the worshipers. Interesting to think about. No such images were used in the cult of Yahweh. Instead, the presence of God was manifest in humans. So as we as the image of God, having the image of God, God's presence could be manifest in us. That's a pretty high anthropology, isn't it? That says quite a bit about, gee, the rather lofty purposes for which we were created. Uh, and again, this Genesis 1 account of creation does paint a less gloomier and higher picture of, of, of humanity. We are given dignity, our purpose is dominion, um, and we can, yeah. Another commandment given to man is to increase and multiply Again, it's much more positive in tone than the J account. Um, we're created from the dust, solidarity with the rest of creation, and yet we have a special place within it, the Imago Dei. So some of the ideas of the Imago Dei, what that means is that we're like God, we have spiritual characteristics, intelligence and free will, we're made for relationship with God. We're given authority. We're sort of deputized to rule on God's behalf. Others and our environment. And made to reflect the glory of God. We're not the slaves of the gods as in the Inimu Elish. But made to reflect the glory of God. And just very quickly, I wanted to talk about the image of God and how that's played out or was played out in the Christian tradition. Perhaps the greatest understanding of the image of God and original sin dates back to Augustine, or the Augustine. Um, the essential task of Augustine and all of his writings, which were voluminous, was to share with us how the image of God could be restored because it had been either besmirched or, um, if you're thinking about it as as a shape or a form, then it's, it's, it's gotten wobbly and cattywampus and so forth, so that we may fully share in the experience of the divine presence as much as we can now. Like we've been kicked out of the garden, right? But still, we can have some relationship with God and we want to maximize that from our point as much as we possibly can. So this image of God within us, which has been sullied or distorted, has to be reformed or restored. For Augustine, the um, 
there was a correspondence between God's intellectual powers and our intellectual powers. So that the image of God really for Augustine was the higher functioning of humans, uh, which kind of makes sense. It, it distinguishes us from the, uh, from the beasts. Um, he, Augustine writes, man was made in the image of God in that part of his nature wherein he surpasses the brute beasts. This is, of course, his reason or mind or intelligence or whatever we wish to call it. He also talks about the fact that this image of God um, is a trinity. Of course, he would. Um, so as there's a trinity of God, a triune God, so there would have to be a trinity within us, right? If we're in this image of God, right? But there's a, see, I mean, we're, we're like, we're, there's a likeness between God and us. And so he thinks it's the, the reason, the memory, which for him is our ability to apprehend the spiritual realities if you're into Plato, the Platonic forms. So there's memory and reason and will by which we may love and choose. Again, there's free will. Important. God has implanted in us a desire to search for him using our minds, our, our image of God, our, the best thing that God has made in us. Like calls to like. The image seeks its archetype. Again, in a Platonic sense. Um, and we want to be more like, the, the image wants to be more like the complete reality. It wants to be perfected. And this is the invitation for us to open the interior eye, as he says, to the triune God. That is through contemplation and introversion. Uh, the God that is already present and active within and thus to attain a vision through the conscious appro uh, appropriation of the image Trinitatis. But of course, the image got messed up, um, and it continues to get messed up. There's sin in the world. So we have this image of God in it where there's sin in the world. We tend to look for God in all the wrong places, if you will. Um, amongst the things of the world rather than the heavenly places. And uh, what we really need and desire is, is God's wisdom and, and sap, it's sapientia in, in, in Latin. We have but a dim perception of what we need, um, bound by sin that we are. Uh, perhaps through creation, but we cannot get to the promised land by ourselves. It's only through God's love in sending us his son to reveal himself and die for us that we can get this full manifestation, as full as we can, of God's presence. It is only through Christ who comes from our homeland, as a human, who can enable us to pass from here to there. See, if you will kind of like getting back to Eden. He does this by making it available a wooden vessel which can traverse the sea. For no one can cross the sea of this world unless he is carried by the cross of Christ. Christ moves us through his revelation of who God is to think on and dwell on and accept God's realities. And through scripture we can do the same thing. Okay, so there's... The image, its distortion, and the way to, to, to restore that image is, is through scripture and being wise and doing those things that we learn through God's revelation. This reforming process of our image of God in us begins at our baptism, and it is a reforming process that is never complete, by the way. It's never perfect, um, and it is only through God's grace and mercy that we get this. So I don't know if that helps at all, but it's a way of, of how a great Christian thinker took this idea of the image of God, showed us how sin destroyed that image, and through 
of God's, with God's help through Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his grace, that we can restore that image as best as possible, or God restore it for us, I really should say, as best as possible, so that we can create in this world situations by which we can be as close as we possibly can to God. Because we all want that. That's what Eden would be like for us, I think, to be in God's presence, in this blessed relationship and presence with God. All right, well, let's stop there. Or do you have any thoughts? Okay, well, let's, let's just take a moment's break here, and we'll come back and talk about Abraham for a bit. We were talking about... Um, sin and going up in that direction. We're going to change directions a little bit and talk about what it is to follow God. And I think if we look at the stories and the pictures, the myths of Abraham and Moses, we see good pictures of what it is to follow God. And I'm going to tip my hands here and I created this in a sense of a, a question, but I'm going to hopefully answer this and hope you'll be able to see these aspects of what it is to follow God as we look through the stories of Abraham and Moses and as much as we can in the time we have left. So um, what is it to follow God? I want to read to you, <clears throat> first of all, a quote from an interview of Bill Moyers with Joseph Campbell. And I um, can't remember the name of the book, but something like The Power of Myth is what it was called. I don't know if you've read that or not, but um, they're speaking of the hero's journey, <laughs> that mythic motif. And uh, Campbell says, there's a large journey to be taken of many trials. Moyers, what is the significance of the trials and tests and ordeals of the hero? Campbell, if you want to put it in terms of intentions, the trials are designed to see, if, to, see to it that the in, intending hero should be really a hero. Is he really a match for this task? Can he overcome the dangers? Does he have the courage, the knowledge, the capacity to enable him to serve? Interesting word. Moyers, in this culture of easy religion, cheaply achieved, it seems to me we've forgotten that all three of the great religions teach that trials of the hero journey are a significant part of life, that there's no reward without renunciation, without paying the price. The Quran says, Do you think that you shall enter the garden of bliss without such trials as came to those who passed before you? And Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, Great is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be who find it. And the heroes of the Jewish tradition undergo great tests before they arrive at their redemption. Campbell you realize what the real problem is, losing yourself, giving yourself to some higher end or to another, you realize that this itself is the ultimate trial. When we quit thinking primarily about ourselves and our own self-preservation, we undergo a truly heroic transformation of consciousness. And what all the myths have to deal with is transformations of consciousness of one kind or another. You have been thinking one way, now have to think a different way. Moyers, how is consciousness transformed? Campbell, either by the trials themselves or by illuminating revelations. Trials and revelations are what it's about. What is it to follow God? Journeys, tests and trials, free choice and big decisions, 
revelations, losing ourselves for something greater, break from the past, transformation, even amidst our imperfection. So think about these things as we go through these stories of Abraham and Moses. Could someone read Genesis 12, 1 through 9? I don't think Nikki will. Her, her mouth is full. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to, came to the land of Canaan, and Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of Morah, and, and now the Canaanite was in the land. Okay. Go forth from your country. Sounds like a journey in the making there. This also introduces the whole idea of this promise or this covenant that God is making. Uh, it's a relationship for sure. And it will foster into a full-blown covenantal relationship. But at this point, God is making promises. Is anything expected of Abraham or Abram at this point? Does he have to do anything? Well, he has to get up and do. He has to go forth. And what is he? Eighty-five years old. Seventy-five. Seventy-five. That you know, that's probably not easy. But he's got to do it. Here's that journey. There's a free a break from the past. I think is so important uh, in the hero's journey. And there's a sense of of I, I have some. Thank you. Uh, free choice and big decisions going on in his life. God has a plan. He's going to help. Abraham attained to this goal, or through Abraham attained God's goals, right? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And as a part of that, I will give you this land. So there are two huge promises, two big uh yeah, promises at this point. One is the great nation. You're going to have lots of kids, and they're going to be a great nation, and it's not just a bunch of people, but they're going to be good people that will bless God and bless others, and they will bless the whole everything. And um, there are no strings attached. I'll also give you this land you find yourself in. Um, and again, no strings attached. All Abraham, I guess, would have to do is, as you say, go and trust in God's promises. So trust is another aspect of this. Again, this is way different than the Sinai covenant. It's just this sort of the beginnings of this relationship that will find its fruition in the covenant of Sinai. And how about we read, skipping on to Genesis 15... Did someone read uh, part of that anyways? Go ahead. After this, Abram had a vision and heard the Lord say to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will shield you from danger and give you a great reward. But Abram answered, Sovereign Lord, what good will your reward do me since I have no children? My only heir is Eliza of Damascus. You have given me no children, and one of my slaves will inherit my property. Then he heard the Lord speaking to him again. This slave, Eliza, will not inherit your property, 
your own son will be your heir. The Lord took him outside and said, Look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. Abram put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who led you out of Ur in Babylonia to give you this land as your own. But Abram asked, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that it will be mine? He answered, Bring me a cow, a goat, and a ram, and each of them three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. Abram brought the animals to God, cut them in half, and placed the halves opposite each other in two rows. But he did not cut up the birds. Vultures came down on the bodies, but Abram drove them off. When the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and fear and terror came over him. The Lord said to him, Your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. But I will punish the nations that enslaves them, and when they leave that foreign land, they will take great wealth with them. Okay. That's good enough for right now. Um, so, again, there's this promise, uh, but God formalizes it through this really gory <laughs> pact that he makes, cutting animals in two and so forth. Don't ask me what all that means or where that came from. I don't know. But it would be an interesting question to, to delve into. But uh, apparently it solemnizes the deal for, for Abraham or Abram. And this is, again, a one-sided kind of deal. There's also a forecast of the future. He gives Abram a little clue about more of the details of what's going on here. Um, yeah, there's going to be, it's not just down to you, but there's going to be generations and enslavement and so forth. But it's all going to turn out all right. Don't worry. And um, can someone read 18 through 21? <clears throat> On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to, uh, saying, to your descendants I give this lamb from, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The land of the Kenites, the Kenezites, the Gadmon, yeah, yeah. yeah. etc., etc., etc. Yeah. Ad infinitum. Yeah. So basically, the idea there is, um, he's promised Abram a great family, and he's taken him out to to show the stars in the sky, and, stuff. and then he he also becomes more specific about the land, actually which land he's going to inherit and, and its boundaries. Okay. It's always been interesting to me that God promises him all this land, the land of these people. They live there already, yeah. but they get bupkis. <laughs> and he created them too. So that's, mm. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, a, it, it's an that. interesting ethnocentrism, I would say, on the part of the authors, but... Well, apparently on the part of God. <laughs> yeah. That too. I don't know what to do with that. No, I never have either. Um, there are a lot of places where, in order to make his plan be fulfilled, for example, his people are enslaved for 400 years. In order to make this work, this country has to enslave them. But don't worry, I'll punish them when it's over. Yet they're helping God fulfill the promise that he made to Abram. So exactly. they're playing their part as they were meant to do. But yeah, Vaughn, it's actually because when yeah. you get to where Pharaoh, and like God's God's Harding. hurting Pharaoh's heart, and I'm like, well, I don't know why you're calling him the bad guy if you're making him the. <laughs> you're doing it to him. He has no. What can he right. could say? No, God, don't harden my heart. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even know his heart's being hardened. Yeah, but so so I mean, everybody's playing That's their the thing part. That's the Old Testament thing. Confusing. It's very he interesting. He does that to a lot of people. Mm. And let's just, maybe we can think about it this way. We'll, <laughs> we'll probably get into this if we have a chance to go too deeply into the story of Moses. But um, it preserves God's ability to change hearts and minds and be all powerful. Uh, he can harden Pharaoh's heart. But there are just as many passages where it says that Pharaoh chose mm -hmm. to do these things. So there's a preservation of free will as well. 
I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> I know it's so much. I, I, I don't actually find it all that worrisome because I figure, I mean, it's not like best. we're surprising God. Right. The fact that, let us say, Adam and Eve ate the apple. This didn't surprise God. He knew that was coming. <laughs> he already he had a plan in place on this <laughs> Again, you're right. His sense of, of plan, of, of God, of history, of transcendent and also imminent in this process as well. So, um, Genesis 17. Someone can read it. Bobby? When Abram was 99 years old. Yeah. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. And Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all of the land of Canaan for perpetual holding, and I will be their God. Keep going. Okay. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Okay, great. So this one does have some conditions, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So all males must be circumcised. All right, so there is um, a progression, maybe you would say, um, or it could be a different author who, who makes that um, a condition that all, all of the uh, males must be circumcised. If we keep reading on, um, we'll find that Abram's actions are not always exemplary. Uh, he is imperfect. He can be somewhat of a coward, perhaps. Again, we're looking at that story when um, Abraham, Abraham passes off his wife as his sister, which is always kind of weird. And <laughs> this gets really hard in Sunday school. <laughs> Starting oh, with the oh, circumcision part. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are we doing here? Something I don't know myself. <laughs> right. It's just leave it to the fact that he wasn't perfect, um, but God doesn't seem to hold it against him. And as a matter of fact, he punishes um, Pharaoh in one of the accounts with, with plague because of the fact that, that uh, he had taken Sarah. Um, and yet, uh, finally, after many, many years, the promise begins to look like it's coming true by the fact that their son Isaac is born in chapter 21. The, 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 you know, nothing good can, could come of this promise. There was no way to have a great nation without having Isaac. And so Isaac is born, and God is true to his word. The promise begins to be fulfilled. He is true to the relationship with uh, Abram. He fulfills the plan even miraculously. How old is Sarah when she has Isaac? Something like, something like that. Really, really old. <coughs> She's 90, I think. Yes, she's 90. So it's miraculous, and, and, and it takes God a while to do this. Again, it's God's time, not Abram's time or our time. Um, and 
then we get to the picture. And there's lots in this story, and it's a wonderful story. And if you have a chance ever to just do a Bible study following the course of Abram's life and so forth, it's just really fascinating. We don't have enough time to do that here. But one of the points that the authors of our books talk about is, is the sacrifice of Isaac. So, um, that's in chapter 22, and it says, God tests, God tested Abraham. He didn't know it was a test, of course. Um, chapter 22. Lisa, can you read? Sure. Yeah. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took them with his with two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he <coughs> went up to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on your boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of a son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay, great. Wow. Because you have obeyed me. What do you make of the story? I don't get it really, because he had already God had already told Abraham, I'm going to make this covenant with you. I'm going to make your offspring numerous and bless the whole world through you. And in the end, he says, okay, so since you didn't withhold Isaac from me, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Well, I thought he was going to do that anyway. It's also a little self-serving because the author makes quite clear that that's Abraham's only son. <coughs> the son that he loves. <laughs> Yes, he makes a big deal of that. Not only uh, uh, is Isaac a, a means to this promise, but he loves his son. And it's his only son. So if that <coughs> Isaac goes away, then where is Abram? So if you make a covenant with God, watch out for the gotchas later. Yeah. Ooh. And you're being tested. <laughs> yes. But it is. also makes really clear that Ishmael is nobody. Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, that's 
that's another thing altogether. That's it's one of those legend <laughs> legendary things, isn't it? Um, but uh, right, you said test, and, and it is a test, and it is a trial. Um, I think it's sort of a test and a trial of this whole command obey relationship. Um, might just be as simple as that. Um, also, the fact that Abraham believes God that even if he would yeah. even if he sacrificed Isaac somehow or other God is still going to fulfill this promise right. Sarah so, just have another kid so there's not only <laughs> yeah so there's not only this obedience thing going on but there's a trust thing as well how old was Isaac here they don't really say because so Abraham's super old. How's he going to subdue this kid who could probably knock him on his feet? Well, <laughs> we always yeah we always talk about that too. Did he really well, just go up a little bit? Yeah, like I'm so horrified. I know we're there. I know we're supposed. Well, I don't know that we're supposed to. I don't. Did the author? Are we supposed to reflect forward and say, oh, okay, it's a very Christ-like image. God's only son, who he loved. I mean, is that would that have been the intent of the author writing this at this time? <laughs> he had no intention of us reflecting on Jesus. Right. That's for sure. Certainly, the New Testament folks reflect reflected back. back, and of course, the makers of the lectionary use that right. for Good Friday. It seems Absolutely. so horrible, though. It seems well, then, so horrible. <laughs> Supposed to feel think, like think about that, think about it. Just widen the lens a little bit here. I know it is horrible. <laughs> yeah, it is. Horrible. I struggle with this one. But, that, but so you know, the sacrifice at that period of time was not normal. I mean, well, I don't know if it was normal, but not unusual. <laughs> Again, think about myths a little bit here, and think about the fact, even of the Passover, which is horrible, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, even in Exodus, it says you're supposed to set aside your firstborn for God, which could mean sacrifice, but it's redeemed by a lamb, a spotless lamb. Okay. So, I mean, it sets up this whole idea of sacrifice, which becomes so important in the history of Israel, so important for us. What do we do in the Eucharist? Yeah, that's actually a sacrifice. Um, it's more than a sacrifice, but at least it's a sacrifice. Um, so it has this explanatory force. I don't think it's right. I don't think, I, you know, child sacrifice, not, not good. <laughs> but um, <laughs> ever <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, you know, God's modus operandi here. It's what God does. And we keep saying, seeing this, that God has this plan. And yet we're free. God is engaged in all that's going on, and, and even will redeem the situations. But we're still free to choose to, to do those things that God asks of us to do. Was Sarah like one of Abraham's tests and trials, maybe? Because I've always sure. looked at her that she was just not very nice, and why was she <laughs> honored, and why was she anything that she didn't? She laughed, which, I mean, I think I would have too at that age. Yeah, yeah, and, well, yeah. I think that's and then she was mean to Hagar, and she was just... I can't really like her. I, I can't get wrap my head around yeah, but anything about her. her too. Very human. Me and I am kidding. You don't. Two. You it's sterile true. woman. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it's a human response. I mean, it makes yeah, sense yeah. that she. Yeah. It's not incredible that she would have done that. Yeah. To me. It's not the right thing to do. Right. But it's I, not anybody probably would. You know, it, this imperfection comes out pretty, pretty often as well. So, I mean, we've got a journey up to Moriah, a test, a trial. He has a free choice, a huge decision to make. There's this revelation this, of this lamb in the thicket, or whatever it was, a ram, I guess it was, mm -hmm. a ram in the thicket. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's a, a lot of this going on for Abraham, losing yourself. For something greater, that something greater is just God, being obedient to God. Um, and I don't know if he was transformed through that. There was earlier on, we talked about that covenant where, no, you're no longer Abram, but you're Abraham. There's a sense through this covenant that you're being transformed. And uh, yeah, people like Sarah and Abraham are imperfect, although this 
story, apparently, the way it is written in Hebrew is so stark, it's almost chilling, mm -hmm. that um, no questions asked, starts to, you know, go up the mountain with the wood, and, you know, there you go. I'm going to do it. God says it, so I'm going to do it. Uh, so I don't remember which book, but he was saying that it may have been written to... Um, as, as, as the anti-child sacrifice, that that was part of that was part of the surrounding cultures, and true. so this was a statement against it. Yeah, true. That makes sense. And one of our authors writes the fact that child sacrifice perhaps had been a part of the tradition in Israel, and this was a way of breaking that. So I don't know if that helps at all. What I said, it, it makes sense of it, but it doesn't necessarily make it okay, I guess. It's a mystery. No, no. <laughs> and then there's that. And then I'm there's glad that. they're nice. Yeah. No, it's just one of many stories in the Bible that you kind of wince at when you read it. Mm -hmm. But it's modern, it's our modern sensibilities. I mean, I yeah. say modern sensibilities, but I'm sure well, 4,000 years ago, Nobody would have batted an eye at that story. Hagar needs child support. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I want half. I just think about Court Isaac. I mean, they don't yeah. talk about how no, he felt about no. this whole thing. Well, He's you know, he kind of turned out kind of wimpy. I think that this really had a pretty big. Psychologically, it has to have been You know what PT has to do? One of the problems. stories that I just can't get my head around, and it, it's in this cycle. Is the story of Jacob and Esau? I, mm -hmm. It still uh, bugs me. Yes. I I don't know how he can get get away with that. Yes, I agree. I don't I don't know why they would put that in. Why? Isaac was wimpy. <laughs> yeah. He he does not he come out as a really point. strong character no, in this. So he no. was scarred for life. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you come out of? That's true. They nearly <laughs> sacrificed. <laughs> Good point, good point. I also like Hammurabi as a point of reference between modern, mm. because when I was, a hundred years ago when I was in school, <laughs> they, they, they didn't tell you why that was a big deal when Hammurabi yeah. had the law. Well, because before they had the law, up an eye for an eye, which we go, uh, yeah. it was blood feud. Right. You, you didn't take an eye, you killed all of the other guys. <laughs> ah, okay. That's a whole no thing I don't proportionality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like it, and, and, and that's an international Yeah, well, that's where the Jane Guild came, ab came about because rather than having the, the ongoing feud here, this is the value, that's what you get out of Right. And, well, and, and it carries over into international law right now because you can't drop a nuke. <laughs> When they just shot at you with one bullet, mm -hmm. it's right. called Dis proportionality. <laughs> Disproportionate. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, this is. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, we're an interesting. Very <laughs> prayer must have stopped. The Old Testament is confusing. It is. <laughs> so let's push on towards the Exodus, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> and if you could turn in your Bibles. And someone read Exodus 2, verses 21 through 3 1. I can read that. Moses agreed to stay with the man who his daughter, Sephora, or I'm sorry, let me start over. That doesn't make sense. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter, Sephora, to Moses in marriage. Sephora gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershon, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that through, saw that through the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And then 3-3, three, three, you said? 3-1. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. That's all right. No problem. Um, so certainly we have this God of relationship again, a God who is concerned with his people, um, able to break in. He's not just up there somewhere doing something else, but oh my gosh, he sees the plight of his people, calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac. So, I mean, there's a sense of continuity with the past. He remembers his promise. Uh, though, even though the, all this time has gone by, um, there's this, it's the same God, same M.O. Um, and uh, at one point I, I wrote something about Moses being a shepherd, and I'll just share that with you. Um, two crucial points should be understood about Moses' shepherding life. First, to be a shepherd was not a particularly high calling, but shepherding had great symbolic import. The imagery of shepherding is, of course, frequent in the Bible. Much of Israel's history was pastoral, even when, or pastoral, even when uh, agriculture became dominant in Israel, replacing shepherding, there remained a nostalgia for the pa pastoral. The patriarchs and David him himself were all shepherds, and shepherd became a figurative term for the rulers of God's people. Yahweh himself is portrayed as a shepherd in the prophets, for example, in Ezekiel 34. God might have been pictured as a tender of the vine and the planter of seed, but the imagery of God remained more familiarly the shepherd of the flock. How can we forget that most beloved of the Psalms that begins, the Lord is my shepherd? What was so special about being a shepherd? Why did leaders need shepherding on their resume? Well, there are those qualities of tending and guiding sheep that could equally apply to people. And it seems to be important to God that a good leader exhibit these qualities even with the least and the last. According to one story, once Moses saw a little lamb escape from the flock, he followed the lamb and eventually overtook it at a brook quenching its thirst. Had I known that thou wast thirsty, I would have taken thee in my arms and carried thee thither, he said. As thou livest, a heavenly voice resounded, thou art fit to shepherd Israel. It's from a midrash, a commentary. Secondly, being a shepherd is a relatively quiet and solitary job. It gives Moses time to be alone in the wilderness. Kalish writes, the solemn solitude of the dreary desert was to prepare his mind for the sublime commission for which providence had selected him. Times of quiet and stillness should not be underestimated as places of pro profound preparation and deep encounter with self and with God. Indeed, it was for this reason that the children of Israel spent such a long time in the wilderness after God had won their freedom. Just a quick side note on that. Um, the solemn solitude of the dreary desert. That is one image that we evoke when we think about um, Lent, as a matter of fact, right? And uh, we just spent three days earlier this week at a clergy conference in which the topic was solitude. As a preparation for Lent, we had this conference and um, talked about a way of, you know, ways of being in solitude and that sort of thing. Uh, it's worth thinking about and it has value and it is a place of preparation and revelation. Keep those in mind uh, and maybe you can find a little solitude in the course of your days. Uh, maybe you have enough solitude. I don't know, maybe you need people in your life um, in interaction with people and relationships. But for, for a lot of us, um, solitude is, is a, a nice break, a nice quiet time for us to be in relation with God. 
and hear God speaking to us. So, um, in Exodus 3, we learn that one day Moses led his flock to the farthest reaches of the wilderness, and there in this outer extremity he encounters God. He sees a bush that is burning but will not be consumed. Interestingly, this burning bush has not only been seen as a mode of divine revelation, but it has also been thought to be a symbol of Israel itself, small and lowly among nations, and yet indestructible. Indestructible by God's continued preservation and presence, and the presence of the divine spirit within the nation. Interesting. No? Again, there's that God who's working out his plan, who's with his people, who's, who's shepherding his people, who's, who's directing his people. Um, so don't underestimate that, that, that uh, vocation of being a shepherd. And I think that um, maybe we have occasions to be shepherds in our own life, but I think there's a great... Um, there's a great balance of tenderness and toughness, I guess, that a shepherd must exude, that uh, Moses certainly did, and we certainly can as followers of, of our good shepherd. So, um, let's find out what happens with the burning bush here. Why don't we read... Um, Exodus 3, 11 and 12, just 11 and 12. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought this people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Okay, great. So, <coughs> God commissions Moses to lead the children of Israel out of their bondage. God commissions a human agent, deputizes this guy, right? Gives him authority to do this wonderful shepherding uh, of his people. And, um, of course... <laughs> Moses objects. I don't know what it is about when God makes an offer, but oftentimes the prophets say, you know, who am I? I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, all the biggies have problems when God commissions them to do things. And so this is a bit par for the course, and yet God says that he will be with him. And, and he goes on to show him a sign. So, also it shows, I think, the fact that uh, we're beginning to see that Moses isn't perfect either. He's a little, he objects here a little bit. Uh, hey, who am I to do this kind of thing? So, what goes on um, in 13 through 22? Could someone read that? Nikki? Mm -hmm. But Moses replied, When I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors sent me to you. They will ask me, what is his name? So what can I tell them? God said, I am who I am, you must tell them. The one who has called me, the one who is called I am, has sent me to you. Tell the, tell the Israelites that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have sent you to them. This is my name forever. This is what all the future generations are to call me. Go and gather the leaders of Israel together and tell them that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appear to you. Tell them that I have come to them and have seen what the Egyptians are doing to them. I have decided that I will bring them out of Egypt, where they are being treated cruelly, and will take them to a rich and fertile land, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The people will listen to you to what you say to them. Then you must go with the leaders of Israel to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has revealed himself to us. Now allow us to travel three days into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless he is forced to do so, 
but I will use my power and will punish Egypt by doing terrifying things there. And after that, he will let you go. All right, good. So, <clears throat> Moses comes back with another objection. Well, I'm not sure how the people are going to react to me just waltzing in there and <laughs> saying that you sent me to do something. What shall I tell them? Who, who are you? Um, they're going to want to know more about you and more about your plan. And so patiently God answers. And he says that he is, well, I am the God of your fathers, but I'm also the I am that I am, right? Uh, what, what do we make of that? We had some notes in our reading about that. Um, I think that it is, in a sense, God refusing to answer. I mean, it's rather opaque, isn't it? His answer is sort of a non-answer in a way. Um, uh, we also hear that um, I am who I am is a, a self-contained, incomprehensible being. Okay, so it sort of harkens to God's transcendence. Another way of apparently um, translating that is I will be who I will be, which speaks more of God's future acts and, and self such that God's intentions will be revealed in his future acts. I will be who I will be as you will see me act in your life, in the life of Israel. Um, and another one of the authors says, um, it emphasizes the actuality of God. I am there wherever it may be. I am really there. I am. I exist. I truly am real. I don't know. How does that float your boat? Any of those do it, do it for you? <laughs> ego, ego, amy. Ego, amy. True. Mm -hmm. I think when when you read this you you kind of get a sense that about Moses being resistant mm -hmm. when you hear it read out loud you kind of go no those are pretty sensible questions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would do the same <laughs> yeah that's right that's yeah right. really really well, who am I to do that I don't do that and of course <laughs> <laughs> could talk to me you could talk to them I don't want to go to Nineveh <laughs> Yeah, good point. Um, and again, this is that uh, kind of commissioning that also, uh, I don't know if it changes the relationship, but it, it takes it up a notch, really. He is the God of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But now he has a new name, Yahweh. And um, from now on, Israel will refer to God as Yahweh. This is who they will follow. Okay. So, moving on, we've had one objection, two objections. <laughs> now let's read chapter 4, 1 through 9. Uh, who wants to read? Bobby? I can read. <clears throat> then Moses answered, But suppose they do not believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake, and Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. And God said, Put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you, sh you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Okay. So yeah, um, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> Moses, okay, so, you know, you commissioned me, and yeah, you got a new name, and your purposes are, are all good, but I'm going to need some proof that you sent me. So, what do you got? And so, he's sort of, uh, I don't know, they're like parlor tricks or something in a way. <laughs> um, what is it, the leprous hand, and mm -hmm. the staff, and yeah. the snake, and the, the blood, blood, and the water, these things? Which he will go ahead and, and in fact do for them. So and he was right to ask because they did indeed ask him those They things. did. They did indeed. Yeah. And he was able to trot those right out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the kids always want to know why we don't have these kind of things done now. Like why someone isn't given the ability to do mm -hmm. that. Like why did they get all the good... Why did they get all those good miracles yeah, back it's then? Like what was, what, what's different? You can never answer. What do you tell them? That's a great question. <laughs> That's what I say. That's a good question. And we're going to talk to Father about that. <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. The long as you ask Father Garl. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's see. We've had three objections, right? Or has it, was that number four? Have we read 10 through 11? 10 through 12? No, we're about to. Do okay. Speak? So I'm going to read 10 through 12. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf, deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Okay. So, <laughs> Moses, did I... Failed public speaking at Egyptian <laughs> University. Come on, I can't do this. And maybe Yahweh starts getting a little ticked at this point. What do you think? Yeah. Um, it's like, let's remember who I am here, folks. Um, and uh, then, let's see, that's the fourth one. Now there's actually a fifth one. 13 through 17. Leslie? But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. <laughs> then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he, that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and... I, even I, will be your, uh, be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Okay. And at that, Moses finally takes off. So, I guess there's hope for us. Given as many objections as we can throw in God's way. Um, so, journeys... He has this big decision to make. He is free, but you know, and he objects. And Moses, you get a, a, some of his character. I mean, he's not just a cardboard character, is he? He's, it's filled out here in, in the way he talks to God and, and what he says about himself. Um, there's this great revelation. Yet he has to subsume himself under this charge from God. I mean, it's doesn't sound like it's something he really just wants to go out and do, but he does it because you know, God is God, and it's a break from the past for him, and um, he's gone through a number of transformations in his life, uh, from being in Egypt, and then being the shepherd out in the desert, and then going back to Egypt as leader of the people, uh, and yet, as we see, he's certainly not perfect. Not completely faithful or obedient, but um, God uses him anyways. With some help. With Aaron, right? Eh, you don't have to do it alone. I'll give you some help. That's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. So, um, I think that's a pretty good list in, in the sense of, of the mythic ideas about what it is to follow God. And I hope you can see yourself on that list, or 
in these um, characteristics of what it is to follow God. It is a journey. That's really the best way of describing things. We do have tests and trials. And it is up to us. And it is about losing ourselves. Sometimes we have to break from the past. And it's a journey of transformation even though and it's a journey even amidst our imperfection. All right, any points you'd like to make about Exodus 3 and 4? Then we have a chance to hear Dale's paper. <laughs> Yay! Oh. Yay! You want me to go up there? Sure. <laughs> oh my goodness. Any heresy that I might commit, <laughs> my own fault. And it's not intentional. I learned that on on, on Google. <laughs> if it's not intentional, it's not quite as bad. Uh, I titled my paper "Myth: Myopic, Hyperopic, or What Way Are We Looking?" Uh, I, I told B Bobby just before class. I, I took a class and. 19th century utopias, and one of our problems was to create our own utopia as a group, and we named ours myopia, <laughs> short-sightedness. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, uh, in, in serious conversations, most, most protestants needed to find their own terms. Does a myth equal a silly story, or does length of historic time assure that it is silly? Mm. If we project into the future, how far in the future does it become a silly story? What if myth just means an explanation of the origin of the situation of which we are the result? Do, do we follow Sartre into nothingness to find our niche? I think some parts of a myth definition should simply be etiology, which I think Father mentioned earlier. It's the study of origins. It is the singularity exploding into an ever-expanding universe a silly story just, be, just because we believe that it could have happened? Is myth a theory? Is it a theory, a myth, because we speculate it happened four plus billion years ago? Is it silly? Humans seem, humans seem to attempt to order our reality, or ask God to do it, uh, so that it makes some sort of sense based on the information that we have available to us in our time. And time is a slippery construct, construct particularly if we have any notion of a power acting outside of our, our own construct. Information doesn't routinely, I was an intelligence officer, believe it or not. Information does not routinely rise to the level of fact. Nonetheless, we must operate on what we know or think we know. There was a sociologist who put it pretty well. Uh, in a paraphrase, it is some, something to focus our thought. That is, things a person perceives as real are real in their consequences. Galileo and the Catholic Church are a good case in point. The Reformation triumvirate of Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin all attested to solo uh, scriptura, uh, it's only, it is all scripture, was the way of truth. Large swaths of Christianity continue in this allegiance despite those very theologians' bitter disputes over the meaning of Sola Scriptura. Much ink and blood has been spilt over those differences and the roles of historical accuracy in our social sciences continue to plague us. If Adam and Eve are, for argument's sake, mythical in nature, does this mean that we should relegate them, as Trotsky would say, to the dustbin of history? <laughs> or must we appreciate the paucity of, paucity of information available thousands of years ago, not to mention the difficulty 
of communicating over large, vast differences and multiple languages. We should appreciate the role of myth in its attempt to explain the nature of reality using necessarily limited information and resources. As we believe much in the Old Testament was originally oral, and as literacy rate, rates were undoubtedly minuscule, perhaps we should focus on our study of myth, truth, and silly stories to things that, that were plausibly explained by them and delve into the inter eternal threads. The authors or uh, author or authors of Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve anticipates Descartes, I think therefore I am statement with the question of why do I think? Is the knowledge of good and evil improved by situational relativism? These questions and many others are still being argued in written and oral form. How far we must be removed from the dawn of human existence to recognize some eternal arguments and the necessity to engage them? Are the problems of deceit, greed, transgression, and murder in the story of Adam and Eve solved, or are they eternal? Whether one subscribes to Hobbes, Marx, or God, the struggles of human existence carry on. The ancients were aware of human imperfection. Our myth helps us order our relationship with God and our fellows. And I went. To, I had to go to a class on anger management because I sent some of my soldiers there. So <laughs> you, you have to go and make sure that it's good for them. An anger management tool points out that if we are only following ru rules because God or the man will punish us, then we only have slave values. It is worth noting that in the story, God did not inflict guilt on Adam and Eve. They inflicted it on themselves because they had transgressed. Wow, well done, sir. Oh. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you. I love the way you really talk about um, myth and fact and, and mm -hmm. why myth is important. I, I, I just really found that Excellent. Because I don't want to go in Sartre's niche yeah. of nothing. <laughs> really I don't great. like that idea. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll try and, and, and be able to read our papers. I'm not sure we will all the time, but uh, that's the goal because it's really fun to hear from one another. Um, and it's, we are all uh, made wiser by our, our input together. So it looks like we're going to be doing some delving more into the um, story of the Exodus. We'll be reading Collins chapters 5 and 6 and Rutledge 4. We'll continue our journey through Exodus uh, in 5 through 10 and um, Genesis 12 through 25. And I will hope to get a paper uh, topic to you in the next few days. Okay. Did that give you enough time when I did send the topic? Or was enough time? Mm -hmm. okay. Good. So it, this is my first time through this material, so I kind of have to make sure I've read it <laughs> before I can ask you to comment <laughs> on it. Yeah. So, um, but this has been a great class. I really enjoyed it. So um, thank you. I think we're done for today. Thank you.